The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. I'm Patrick, Head of Technology at professional services firm Collins SBA. I'm a former financial advisor who just loves solving business problems and creating better client experiences using technology. Join me each week as we unpack the tech on offer to advise professionals, stay on top of tech trends, and help you break free from the analysis paralysis experience when building and maintaining a great tech stack. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where your clients have the best wealth technology at their fingers. With NetWealth's next-gen client portal and mobile app, clients can view and manage their portfolio, assets, and accounts wherever they are. By adding external bank and property feeds to their NetWealth account, they can get a true picture of their wealth. And by giving them the ability to transact and manage their cash, they can feel in control of their wealth. A world of client engagement awaits. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Today we're talking tools for enhancing client relationships, building trust quickly, enabling powerful conversations and behavioral profiling with Catherine Hunt, co-founder and head of research at Money Mind Profile. So Catherine's a former financial advisor, university academic, as well as a consultant and public speaker. And what she has built in Money Mind Profile is something that helps advice teams quickly understand the money values, money behaviors, tolerance for risk, stickability to the plan, fee sensitivity, and more of prospective and existing clients. This is something that is incredibly easy to slot into your onboarding process, and it's a really engaging and powerful way to introduce clients into your business. I started by asking Catherine what the oldest piece of tech she still owns is and whether she still uses it. So technology to me is the things that I basically worship, which are tools. Right. And I have six acres. So I have a wheelbarrow, which is 2,000 years old, the tech, approximately. I think, don't think it got to Europe until 1,200. They were a bit backward. Um, but like spades and shovels are literally 10,000-year-old tech. And, okay, on the boring side, sure, my Kindle is going so strong at okay. 11 years old. So strong. Nice. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be in the wheelbarrow industry, or maybe I do. Like they obviously last a long time and they're pretty simple. But yeah, I keep getting different answers on what tech is. So, but I'm, I'm on board with that. Like I like the different angle of answers we're getting. So, yeah, wheelbarrow, spade or shovel. Yeah, top that. Um, next guests. Anyway, that's really cool. And Kindle, I like the. I still don't know how they do it, but it just somehow it just looks like a page. Like it's just awesome. And, it and just you, feels, you can just leave it in the sun. You can drop it in the pool. You can overcharge it. You can undercharge it. It'll just bounce. It's incredible. Nice. It's there with you. No, mm. that's really cool. Um, speaking of there with you or maybe more so by your side or a co-pilot and, yeah, I mean, are there any maybe one or two cool ways that you're using AI either personally or in your sort of business ventures, Catherine? I use ChatGPT for a heap of things. I also just play around with it. I try and take the advice of Seth Godin. He says, you should be spending half an hour playing with AI, the different tools, a day, every day. A day, okay. Just play with it. Like there's no outcome. Just see what it can do. See how smart it is, how dumb it is, what it it looks like here and there. I built like a little app, an ethical edutainer, you know. I'm like, oh, that'd be cool. Kind of like like me, right? I like to talk about ethics, (laughs) but I like to make it fun. Cool, I'll make a little, little AI app that does that. And I, and I was working through and trying to figure out what its is- actual issues are. So okay. I, I use it all the time, usually for things I know the answer to. And I also uh, test it all the time because I have a farm. So I know about things in the real world, like the tactile world, as yes. well as the, <laughs> the imagination the world of yeah. tech, the cloud. So I test it and it gets things wrong all the time, which is funny. But I use it for personal things as well. Like I had Ross River virus a month or two ago. And it said like, oh, there's um, cartilage degeneration. And I'm like, what? That sounds psycho. <laughs> and oh I was like, gosh. hey, um, ChatGPT, so with Ross River virus, um, when they say cartilage degeneration, what do they mean? And, and it's like, oh, they mean pain. I'm like, oh, oh 
I can do it. Thank you. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> perfect. No, so it's, it's useful in everything. Oh, definitely. I, I, I just on the sort of fact checking side of it, like if it's getting things wrong that you know are wrong. Like I, I find myself like if I ask it a question and yeah, I'm not sure about the answer. Like I'm using Google to fact check it, but it's, but obviously, um, the whole sort of World Wide Web is that's what it's built off. So. Yeah, interesting behaviour for me. It's anyway. hard <laughs> using it yeah. to check itself, basically. So what exactly. I do if I actually need an answer from it is I say, "Hey, love your work. Can you give me the URLs for that and the actual academic references, please?" And often nice. it'll be like, "Oh, I found this in a Vice article," and I'm like, "No, that's not real. That's okay. just a person writing it. Can you find me the right. science?" <laughs> so, nice. so opinion can, being sort of positioned as fact at times. Yeah, to it, it's like it's all the same. It's all written word, right? Okay. Goodness. Mm. Well, sort of moving moving away from sort of hearsay and conjecture and opinion, I'm really keen to learn more about Money Mind and, yeah, what you're doing there. I, I'd love to sort of first uh, ask you, like, where where does Money Mind, do you call it Money Mind Profile? Do you call it Money Mind? Like, where money does mind it sit profile, in the advice tech space? Okay. In, ad- in advice tech, it's unique. There's no competition. It works nice. with everything else. So it nice. fills that gap that we need as financial advisors, but it okay. doesn't actually replace anything that exists. Mm-hmm. And, and what is that gap? The gap is, of course, instant trust. All right. How to build those okay. good relationships with clients and have an efficient client onboarding experience. That's the gap. Nice. And so you mentioned onboarding. Are we... Like where does it sort of fit in that typical advice process for maybe a new client, for example? It depends how creative you are as a financial planner, but stock standard use is client calls in and says, you're really cool, I want to meet with you and maybe hire you as my financial planner. You say, great, someone makes a meeting with them, calendar event, and then the first thing that goes out to them is generally the money mind profile. And so it's almost like the ambassador, you know, the emissary that goes before the emperor and it makes the advisor look incredible before they've even met them. Nice. So they're Mm. they're gathering context, they're briefing the advisor or the advice team prior. That sounds absolutely plus they're actually it's super powerful. Plus, as you know, just the power of even when someone asks you those really important questions, you feel a huge amount of respect just being laid upon you, just from someone asking you like, oh, wow, they really care. They care about the way I learn best. They care about what I'm looking for here. So it's it's the most powerful piece of technology I think that's come out since sliced bread. Just, oh, wow. Um, <laughs> I was going to say the most powerful thing since um, NetWealth introduced family fee linking for your third cousin, but that's probably just more of a sort of sponsor <laughs> plug for the tool. That is a great innovation bread, as well. <laughs> goodness, yeah, close second I think to that. No, that this is really interesting. So, I mean, can you maybe talk to us about like like why did you like obviously this is a problem and you've you've built something that is um, one of a kind. Like, have you been thinking about this for a long time? Like, when did it sort of come to you that we've got to do something about this? Like, talk to me about that process if you can, please. Okay, so ten years ago, I was an academic at Griffith University teaching in the Masters of Financial Planning. Okay, amazing, world's best Masters of Financial Planning in my opinion, (laughs) self-rated. And and of course, they said, look, we've got these new courses. Can you build them? You were a financial planner. You know all this stuff. Yeah, sure. I can do that. Where's all the relationship stuff? Oh, no, no. We don't do like a massive amount of that because of accreditation. It needs to be accredited. Okay. Okay. So, you've got everyone graduating with master's degrees and all the bachelors are the same with a little bit of relationship stuff here and there. But really, they're going to hit the ground, they're going to get in front of a client and you hear it time and time again that the financial advisors who don't have a massive amount of experience, they struggle with building trust with clients because they think they need to say, hey, I'm really smart and I can manage your money and this stuff that no one cares about. Right. So that's that's the motivation. Risk profiling is in there too. I think that's super sexy and I've always wanted to figure out what is the actual um, the full science say on risk profiling, which is yep. yeah, much, much more than just investments. Okay. And so it's a combination of different areas then. Like I think when I first sort of came across it, I was 
in terms of my assumption, I was like, oh, wow, another risk profiling tool. But until I actually took the time to um, stalk you on LinkedIn and, and view your Vimeo videos on it, I've sort of learned that it's a lot more than that. So I'd love to sort of unpack the, I guess, the areas that it covers. I know there's sort of different topics within the questionnaire. Maybe if we could talk about, yeah, the actual yeah meat and potatoes of the questionnaire, what are some of the sort of questions that you're asking? And then we can talk about the output for both maybe the, the financial planning practice as well as the client. Yeah, amazing. Client. Yeah, exactly, because it can go to prospective clients as well. They don't have to be on board, but at the same time, it works for clients who you've had for 20 years and you've run out of yeah, things awesome. to talk to them about. So it's it's a, it's very, very applicable. And so the kind of questions it asks in a really visual, big text, engaging way, you know, one question at a time, just flows, takes six minutes. And questions like, how do you learn? Are you visual, auditory, kinesthetic? Because yeah. if they're visual, of course, we need to make sure we're drawing diagrams in the meetings and we're communicating like that. And, of course, if they're kinesthetic, we need to talk to them, to them about step one, step two, step three. We're going to walk you through it, right? It's a process. So we need to know that kind of thing. It also questions the client. It's almost like an exam that they don't realize it is an exam on yeah. financial literacy, okay. which which is inflation, interest, and diversification. And all these questions are just from the scientific literature. They're not like I found them, but I didn't even need to invent them because the science is there already. Yeah. That's the great fun, great fun. And then there's other really powerful questions like how are you actually going to measure the success of your advisor? It could be investment returns or it could be achieving your goals or not needing to worry about money as well. So there's lots of different options and an advisor needs to know that because that's also the language then that they communicate to the client in. And so what it gives is, yes, we've got this information from the client, but now we're going to tell you what's a question you can ask the client so you've already hit the ground running with them. And then there's, nice. so there's, there's quite a few topics and topics of questions, but the coolest, I think, in terms of advice is probably stickability, which is very, right. very cool. So that's basically impulse control or self-control questions which is that determinant of whether at the three-monthly check-in after implementation, whether the client says, yeah, I'm doing great. I mean, oh, I didn't tell you I got a new car because that cash that was there, I figured it was for, I know you said it was for something, but anyway, there was a sale and so I got $10 off, so I've got a brand new car. And, of course, the advisor is pulling their hair out going, we just put together this perfect plan. That cash was for dollar cost averaging and, oh, so knowing that ahead of time means you can just develop a strategy to protect your client from themselves or not. If they're high self-control like you and I, yeah, then the, the advisor knows, put together whatever plan you want, they're going to stick to it. Wow. And, and one of the um, topics that's really, really cool from a communication perspective is optimism. Okay. So I'm like overly, overly optimistic as are almost all the financial planners I've ever met <laughs> because we're the ones who will go into run our own businesses and really take that step of, okay, it's okay. It'll work out. I'll get clients. It'll be fine, right? That's high optimism people. But what happens if you're high optimism is you also don't care about fees at all. If anyone starts talking to me about fees, I'm like, stop. Stop. Tell me about the value. Like, what am I getting? Tell me the song. Tell me the vision. What's happening here? Yeah, the like, positives. Who, yeah. yeah, who am I going to be because of this? You could say it's $4 million. I don't care. If I'm going to get, you know, a lifetime satisfaction from it, that's fine. I'll pay double. But, of course, if they're pessimistic, low optimism, super fee sensitive. So the communication has to be like the first thing that's ever talked about has to be the fees and it, we have to pull it apart for them and mention it 15 times and just kind of dwell on the fees for them because they're super sensitive and they want to make sure that we're really transparent about that. So you can see that com the communication for a high optimism is so different for someone who's low optimism as well as the actual strategy because if you say to a really high optimism client like me, uh, yeah, you're going to achieve your goals because I'm a great financial advisor, then I'm also probably more likely to say, oh, awesome. Well, that's great. I'll just work part-time unless you caveat and say, hey, 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 as, are we going to achieve your goals so long as you don't change things? <laughs> right. So really important things. And as well, of course, risk, the psychological tolerance for risk is in there, of course, 
it's it's almost a bo- box tick for many people. But these questions are from the science, and so they're um, they're for retail investors. They're like for people, basically. So they're about game shows, and you know, your neighbor has a venture. What would you do? And questions that are that make people think, oh, I can answer that. That's fun. Okay, so you can you can actually. It's easier for a client to sort of put themselves put themselves in that situation rather than a you know picture this the market has fallen forty percent what are you doing yeah yeah how are you going to feel predict how you're going to feel I mean we can't none of us can even predict how we feel when our, when a dog dies you know like yeah. we're like oh no we'll probably be fine and we'll get another one and then you're like crying for three years and it takes six yeah. years to get a new puppy you know we can't predict our own feelings yeah. I'm with you. No, I'm sorry we're sort of delving into a, a personal trauma there, Catherine. But the um, <laughs> you mentioned like the the sort of behaviours there around like impulse control as well as financial literacy. I sort of saw somewhere that you said that money behaviour or impulse control is actually more important than financial literacy. Like, could you talk a bit about that? Because that's yeah. really fascinating to me. Yeah, there's this amazing paper by Gathergood from 2012. John, is, I think, is his first name. In academia, we're very last name oriented. <laughs> so his last name's Gathergood. <laughs> and um, so he did this amazing study, huge sample size, and he was trying to figure out why are people like over in debt. So that's not you have a credit card and you pay it off every month. It's you have a credit card that cannot be paid off in years. You've got, you know, just personal loans everywhere it's just a nightmare cycle yeah cycle it's it's very very bad heart really difficult to get out of so what is it about that is it because as everyone talks about and where a lot of all the funding is oh these people don't know about money that's what it is it's a lack of financial literacy so let's just quiz them quiz their financial literacy okay mm, it doesn't seem to be showing up as the determining factor what else could it be so they they tested what about impulse control what about self-control and they found that self-control or lack of self-control was a bigger determinant of over-indebtedness than financial literacy, which is crazy when we want to get financial literacy training into schools. And mm. the research is basically saying, yeah, you could, but really we need to teach people how to build up their self-control reserves by sleeping better and eating better is basically how. So super oh, interesting wow. stuff. Okay. So that they're just a couple of ways of, of how I guess anyone can build that build that muscle. Okay, that's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, and exactly. then that no, that's awesome. And then I guess we're sort of talking about the yeah the academic literature behind it. I also notice as well it's not just that that's sort of built that tool. You've also been on a big quest in talking to actual practitioners. Do you mind sort of talking about that process as well of how you've how you sort of went about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I was a financial advisor from 2007 to 2011. And then I left and I went overseas and I did my PhD. And when I came back, I came back to the uni, directly to the uni. And they said pretty much straight away, oh, can you build these courses? And of course, I thought, okay, but I haven't been an advisor for three years. Right. And anyway, I'm just one gal, you know, with one set of eyes. I wonder what really needs to be done. So straight away, I just went and basically interviewed, what do you think? What do you think? I'm building these courses. What do you think should go in them? What do you think we should be testing? That's how actually this one assessment item came out of case studies in financial planning. As I asked a few financial advisors, what should we be testing in the capstone course? And they said, "Mm, how well they can ask questions. I'm like, what? (laughs) No one would ever have thought that except literally really top financial planners working right now. Yeah. So I built it into an assessment item based on oh, that wow. feedback. And so I just continued to reach out and just talk to advisors and what's going on in your world, what's the biggest bottleneck? And it continues to this day. You know, last year I heard a lot about SOAs are the biggest bottleneck, so I started yeah. the SOA working group and it just continues. Um, every week I probably talk to I don't know, 10 or 15 financial advisors and just figure out what's going on, what's going yeah. on in your world. Tell me. Nice. I mean, I, I assume – most advisors maybe believe they're a bit like a restaurant where, you know, we do things a little bit differently around here, but do you see a lot of similarities or are there any sort of current trends at the moment, maybe outside the sort of money mind or onboarding experience? I know you mentioned SOAs there, like what sort of um, sort of cliff notes of, 
of um, insights that you're getting from that? Two big groups, basically, and part of it okay. seems to be maybe licensee driven, but not necessarily. But it's basically one group is the super highly efficient set of advisors who can easily have 300 high fee paying clients of 6,000 and above fees. Easy, right. super efficient because they go based on the law and what they need to do and being best practice. And yeah. then there's the other group of, of advisors who are drowning. They feel like they're drowning under this waterfall of compliance paperwork. Okay. And it, there's no difference other than mindset between the two because the rules are the same. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. It's not that the rules don't apply to that group. Like They apply. <laughs> they just do it right. properly. They start mm -hmm. with the client in mind and they run a good business. Yeah. Do you think uh, as part of maybe helping those, that group of advisors with that sort of mindset shift, something like a money mind could help them in terms of introducing that into their advice process? I assume that enables you to maybe take um, maybe tick off indirectly a lot more sort of compliance checkboxes. What would you sort of say to that? Absolutely and directly. So it ticks off. It's okay. another process for risk profiling, but mm -hmm. it's also potentially if it's used right because it can build trust almost immediately or give the financial planner those questions and the prompts to be able to build trust immediately on the first meeting, they should be able to have their onboarding process as having maybe one less meeting as well because often it can take a few meetings to, you know, you probably know what it's like. You're in the third meeting. It might be a strategy discussion about the ideas you're talking about and you say, yeah, we're thinking about this and broadly we're, we're going to probably use that money to go there and the client says, oh, I forgot to tell you um, mm. <laughs> and you're like, what you just told me has meant that we have to all go back to the drawing board. Thank you. And the reason yeah. why that happens, it's not that they forgot. It's that they didn't trust you. Yeah. So it was only then when you actually started with the, the time, the effort, the querying and using your knowledge for them that they realized, okay, I trust this person. Now I'm going to tell them this thing that's going to throw a spanner in the works basically. So that whole process can be streamlined. Not to mention the documentation. The compliance side of having everything documented over time, being able to show clients this was your financial literacy when you came to see us, this was your low self-control when you came to see us, look at how we've helped you. We're not investment managers. Yeah, We do manage money as well as all the other things, but we are so much more. Yeah, and I, I, I would say as well from the questionnaire that you're sort of you're not putting that to the side by any means in terms of the money management stuff, but it's not front and center like a standard risk profiling tool is. Yeah, absolutely. The person is front and center. It really, it's irrelevant to some extent what their psychological tolerance for risk comes out at if they have very low self-control and very high optimism, because that's yeah. going to mean that you have to develop a strategy that's for that client with that in mind. Yeah. Have you, that's, that's great insight. Have you got any sort of tips on like a lot of the time clients are coming into that discovery meeting or engaging as a couple, right? Have you got any tips for maybe couples that are have completely different money mind profiles? Like how would an advisor manage that? Um, maybe one client has high self-control, maybe the other doesn't. That's one example. Yeah, any any tips or tricks? Well, one thing is that it then allows the advisor to move themselves from I'm a financial planner to I'm someone who's going to work with both of you to fix your relationship <laughs> because <laughs> because we know as well that one of you being low self-control and one of you high self-control has not been going well, has it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one of you has always good. been yeah. going, oh, my God, I can't believe you spent that, right? So first off, we're going to help with that as well as part of the strategy. So we're going to work with you and your relationship dynamics, basically, to actually develop advice that's going to serve both of you and your relationship as a whole. So it's a, it's an elevator. It's a, yes, I'm a financial planner and this is my entry level fee that's way too low to, well, actually, I'm I'm an expert in this, developing this strategy for these two individuals and this one unit. Yeah. I think too, like you're you're finding that out, or you're getting insight into that straight away, straight away, rather than three or five years into the advice process. And exactly. Yeah, like you, 
you know, typically we meet with clients a lot more frequently in that first year, but then traditionally it sort of pans out to maybe a check-in call, I don't know, once a quarter or something like that, but often it's not with both clients. It's just with maybe who, whoever's the primary contact in the CRM and you can quickly sort of lose maybe, you know, gradually some of that trust you built too. So I assume doing that profile or whipping out that profile regularly either to review it or do it again is really powerful, right? Mm, absolutely. So the top financial planners that are using it now, some of them are sending it to their clients of 20 years simply yep. because they're, they're saying, we've kind of run out of things to talk about. Yeah. And this lets us have and get back to where we were 15 years ago where we were having these deep discussions around the nuances of our personalities, our characters, our goals, what we want in life. And it's it's almost like it's a conversation prompt for everyone. Also for the client because, yeah. as you saw, they the client gets their nice little report as well. Mm. Of course. And, yeah, as you mentioned, that's very – well, I've seen, seen the example. It's very engaging. It's very easy to follow and um, – yeah, it's got the, the sort of best of both worlds in terms of different learning styles, right? Like if you wanted to, you could just view the image and go, "Yep, that's me," or just or view the the um, you know the wall of not to say wall of text, but the paragraph there. Do you mind sort of talking about that a bit more in terms of it's not just like outlining the you know component of their profile, but it's also giving maybe tips as well on how to approach that situation, approach that client. Yeah, so there's two reports. One goes. And it, they're com- the same structure with the same headings, yep. I suppose. Language, but yep. one goes to the client and one goes to the advisor. And, the ad- of course, the client doesn't get to see the advisor's report. So the one that goes to the client is it's like a reflection tool for the client. And it's I kind of think of it almost like a horoscope. It's like, you know, they've done a six-minute quiz. This isn't the result. This isn't the psychologist's report after 20 years of therapy. This is just a little little tool with some prompts so the client can read it and think, oh, that's interesting. I have high self-control and this means this and this. Oh, yeah, that is me. That's interesting. So it just gives them that little prompt and they want to do it every year because of that report that they get back. And that's the most important thing for every one of us is our client's experience. But then the advisor gets a report that has these structures and the structures are so an insight into the client. So it will tell you if they're for example, high optimism or medium optimism or low optimism, whichever one, plus then it will say what that means for the strategy if there is a strategy change that needs to happen because of that nuance. Yep. Plus then it says communication insight. So, uh, for example, one of the questions is clients have to choose on a spectrum between do you want to gain wealth or avoid poverty? Right. So if the client picks I want to avoid poverty, then it says in the report to the advisor for communicating with this client, make sure you communicate in terms of the risks of not achieving these goals and and you're going to be doing what you're doing to make sure that the non-achievement of the goals doesn't happen. So the clients never end up sleeping under a bridge. They never have to eat cat food. Use that kind of language that will resonate with the client much more. Exactly, because that's what they're motivated by. So if you talk to that client in the kind of language I want, which is tell me about the future and the vision and Mm -hmm. we're going to go, where? whoa, we're so excited, that client's going to be like, you are not for me. I don't know who you're for, but you're not for me. So it's not about right and wrong. It's just about matching. Yeah. I've just thought of this now. Do you think that by having, and this is another benefit of doing this before they've even had that first meeting, it might even... I don't know, cross out some of your advice panel. Like they, these clients may be better suited to this advisor rather than the one that they called. Like what do you sort of think about that? Of course, okay. of course, because you know and we all know the types of people we love to work with and it's basically telling you this is it this type of person. And I do yeah. a lot of work with some of my coaching clients about what their ideal client is. And they love to say this this wanky stuff at, to begin with. Oh, my ideal client is a 45 to 55-year-old. I'm like, stop, stop, stop. No, it isn't. No, it's yeah. not. And they got this much money. No, it's not. It's not. What are the psychological characteristics of the ideal client? What are the psychological characteristics that get them to be that type of person with that much money at that age? That's your ideal client. So we want to be able to see them for who they are, not for just what the, their wallet is. 
Yeah. It's the most course. important first step. And that's what this report's showing advisors, isn't it? It's, yeah, of course, they've passed the screening so they can actually pay the fees, but they're this type of client and every advisor is different in terms of who they love working with. Yeah. No, you, you're right. Like in terms of the sort of niching, like it's very – or working only with a particular type of client or clients or specialising, it's becoming more and more common, which I know you, you'd see that in your sort of coaching um, role. But yeah, I'm guessing there's not a lot of practices or in the LinkedIn banner where it says I focus on visual learners with a high level of self control. <laughs> like maybe that maybe that's what like should be. That's the future. You've yeah, just exactly. documented the future. No, of course not. Of course and not. <laughs> like this this is also a really great way to like if I know we, we tend to try and segment and put clients in buckets, etc. But it's a really, it's a no-brainer way to tinker with or change that typical advice process on a client per client basis, right? Like, for example, if someone needs to know all the detail, mm. maybe sending them the SOA prior to that meeting might be a, a good tip. Great or tip. If, yeah. Or a visual learner, um, you know, it sounds pretty obvious in terms of diagrams, but maybe you don't even whip out the, the written version when you're scrolling through it on the big screen, like you just focus on diagrams. Absolutely. And then documenting that not only within your own files, but to the clients as well. So telling the clients, we sent you the SOA before the meeting because we've already talked about how much you love getting your teeth stuck into the detail. And we wanted you to have that and come prepared with your questions. That's for you, Mrs. Jones. And you, Mr. Jones, we know that you love the big picture and the strategy. So now in our session together, we're going to go through the big picture to make sure that you both get everything you need out of this. So you're you're just elevating your practice, elevating the kind of value that you're bringing. And in terms of pricing and actually being able to charge uh, an ethical fee, you know, prices mm. don't exist, values exist. The value that we're yeah. going to give exists. So that's what it allows, the communication of all the value that we're going to be bringing those clients. Awesome. No, that, I didn't even think of that, like actually letting the client know this is why you did that. Like it's it's – it's small, but it's, you know, proactive and it, it's a sort of little surprise and delight sort of things like I was thinking about you um, sort of stuff. Mm. Uh, that's really cool. And like, do you have any thoughts on, and we might get into this discussion around maybe the roadmap of, of Money Mind profile or the business there. I mean, do you have any thoughts on like the current risk profiling or sort of money profiling landscape in terms of maybe existing options out there? Like a quick yeah, Google yeah. search. Like every industry fund has that sort of standard questionnaire about, you know, time frame to invest and what would you do, et cetera. Like, yeah, your thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah, and those 10 questions that I'm pretty sure if we could go into the AMP office archive uh, from 1982 and yep. find uh, their risk profiling uh, questions, which were used back in the day before we were a profession or even thought we might ever become one, they were yep. used also to map risk for clients, but in terms of how much stock could be sold to them and what yeah. type of stock. So the, the history of risk profiling is very yucky. Like it's not who we are now. It's not who we are at all, which is why the advisors love that I'm calling it more of a behavior profiling for what I've got. But in terms of the actual quantitative risk profiling, yeah, there's heaps and heaps on the market. Capital preferences, I think I've seen them on Ensemble quite a bit as well. Yeah. Obviously, um, one of the they're a really great option, but Oxford Risk are incredible as well. Mm. Finometrica, uh, a bit clunky now, but tried and tested, very well known. Um, and they're very, all of them are very quantitative. And that's the focus is very much in terms of um, mapping each asset class to the level of volatility and risk that um, they see in their crystal ball and that kind of thing. Yeah, I got you. And so um, are you sort of insinuating there that you can you can use Money Mind as the onboarding tool, but then if you maybe have licensee restraints or, or things like that as well as needing to maybe go down, depending on your value proposition, a more deep dive into the quantitative uh, depths of risk profiling, you can continue to use that tool in another part of the advice process, preferably exactly. more than you can. Exactly. And you wouldn't want it to be your emissary. Yeah. Like they're they're really nice. Some of them are very snazzy, but it has its role at that place. You wouldn't send it in the first email. 
Whereas Money Mind Profile, it's perfect in the first email or even yeah, before, much, much even much for more. a prospective client. It's it's adding value straight away. So yeah. it they really work together. That's why I, th- I think I started by chatting about how it's there's no competition. It's unique. Yeah. And no, and that's great awesome. because it means, you know, I can say wonderful things about all of the risk profiling systems. Yeah. Awesome. No, that's I mean, they might be quaking in their boots now if we start talking about the roadmap, but if you've got, um, <laughs> what, yeah, that'll, what are the sort of longer term even plans? That'll, yeah, even that'll be super different though to what's currently yeah, there. no, of course. Yep. Because, you know, I, I try not to be sexist, but they're, they're guys that run those ones and they're so good at this quant stuff. Like they're mm. incredible. I, w- I would love in another life to be um, as good as they are at quant stuff. Um but what I'm interested in is client experience, user experience, yeah. the advisor looking good, all the boxes ticked, of course, sound science behind it all. But I'm interested in gamification and making the client say, hey, you know that uh, that risk profiling tool I did last week? Can I do it again? Oh, yeah. That, yeah. That's what I want. So the roadmap for Money Mind Profile is we're going to be building absolutely a standalone risk profiling tool. And that's the goal. It's the client saying, hey, can I do that again? That was really fun. So, again, very different um, to what's already there on the, in the market. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's already very engaging and already gamified, but you're trying to take that to the next level eventually and, and as se- you said, get that, yeah. Yeah, exactly, and a separate standalone. So Money Mind Profile as it is, clients are already asking to do it every year. Just because of the way it's formatted, but in terms of risk profiling, just risk profiling, so psychological tolerance for risk, risk capacity, risk need, all of those components, yeah, they need to be very, very exciting and very different to what's around right now. Yep, and yeah, I think is it's an incredible first impression for an advice business to send that out and say, hey, this is what's this is what we believe is important, and yeah, actually ask clients questions. Like it sounds simple, but it's yeah it's it's um yeah it's amazing so yeah amazing work um Catherine I'm excited to learn more how can how can others learn more and sort of get involved head they can sign up directly at moneymindprofile.com easiest way perfect amazing and yeah I, I saw that yeah your pricing is very transparent it's very easy to um sort of click through the your sort of onboarding process and, and get started so yeah, I look, I look forward to catching up again with you soon and, and seeing um, how much more sort of gamified it is and maybe there might be a wheelbarrow or a spade or, or some sort of <laughs> reference to, you know, old tech in there, I don't know. Um, anyway, yeah, time to wrap it up. So, yeah, thank you, Catherine. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.